Amen. Well, uh, in case you are not aware, uh, we're in 2013, and last year as a church, in 2012, uh, we had a year of evangelism. We called it Invite 2012, and we uh, learned together how to share our faith, and we encouraged each other to share our faith uh, as we sought to press into what God was calling us to as a church. This year, 2013, we feel God is taking us the next step of that, of that journey, a journey of making disciples. So this year, 2013, is a year of discipleship, what we're calling Invest 2013. Invest in yourself as a disciple, invest in one another as we make disciples together. And this first kind of sermon series uh, in this year, we're calling New Year Revolution. In that little circle there, it says New Year's, in case you were wondering. And uh, really, it's a series where we are looking to get our own kind of houses in order, really, to order our private lives as individuals and as families, but also to order our public life as a church together. So throughout the series, uh, we did it last week, we're going to do it again a little bit later, we'll be doing this survey together uh, where uh, we're just asking you to update your details for our database so we can make sure we contact you uh, when you need to know things, uh, but also to give you an opportunity to feed back a little bit on the life of the church. And we'll do that a little bit later in the service. And we're looking at a number of subjects in this series of New Year's Revolution. So last week, Rick looked at how to be content. We're going to look at how to be just next week, how to be generous. This week, we're looking at how to be shrewd. How to be shrewd. And what does that actually mean? We had a really interesting conversation as we were looking at the different topics that we were going to cover because we wondered whether shrewd was actually quite a negative word that people would think, ooh, I don't know if I want to be shrewd. Of course, we were then reminded that Alan Sugar was looking for an apprentice and that apprentice had to be drop-dead shrewd. So that reassured us somewhat. But the truth is, is Jesus here speaks of the parable of the shrewd steward. It used to be called the parable of the dishonest manager, and that, was, that made it a bit more difficult if Jesus seemed to be encouraging dishonesty with our finances. Would he really be doing that? Is Jesus saying, look, here's a guy, he rips his boss off. He was onto something. You do the same thing. If you think that, well, we'll see where we go today. So I want to begin by saying what is perhaps obvious, but I still think needs to be said, the steward is shrewd, not dishonest. And we're going to just unpack the parable a little bit first before we then look at three simple implications and applications that we can draw out of it. So the parable is about this steward, a manager. You can imagine uh, it's a kind of chief, chief, exec, uh, chief operating officer, chief finance officer combined into one. Imagine you've got Jackie Driver and Darren Wolf in front of you and you combine them into one. This was the sort of person that you would have. He was a fund manager. In the Greek, the word is oikonomos. He oversaw the, the, the business of the household, both its organization and its finances. And the master confronts his steward because he hears negative reports. Notice he says he's been accused of wasting his master's possessions. That's verse 1. So we're not here talking about theft. We're not here talking about fraud. I think we're talking about mismanagement rather than misconduct. And so he confronts the steward. He says to him, I'm launching an investigation. You're going to have to give an account for your actions and it is likely, if not certain, that you are going to be dismissed. And the steward knows that his boss is right. I wonder if you've ever been in that situation yourself. And he clears his desk. He knows he's not going to get a reference. So what is he going to do? He knows himself. He knows that he doesn't have the physique to dig. I'd be in that position as well. He's too proud 
to beg. What is he going to do? Well, Jesus says he acts shrewdly. He recognizes quickly that without references, he's going to need favors. He's going to need patrons. And so he calls in his master's debtors and he reduces their bills. Now, it's quite significant, isn't he, the reduction? The first reduction is 50%. The second reduction is 25%. Now just imagine for a moment if you have a credit card and you've maxed out your credit card and one day you get a call from the credit card company and you think, oh dear, I'm in trouble. And the voice at the other end of the phone says, "Uh, it's your lucky day, sir, madam. I would like to reduce your credit card bill to cut your debt by 50%. That would be great, wouldn't it? And then they say, right at the end, oh, by the way, uh, My name's Rod, and I'm looking for a job. Is that what was going on there? Is this revenge? So is he using his master's money to make sure that he's got a job to go to after he's fired? So when we talk about shrewd, are we here then talking about being spiteful or scheming, a conniving, calculating kind of man? Is that what shrewd means? Well, it's it's hard to understand why the master, when he found out what was going on, commends him for his actions. It's hard to understand if Jesus would be commending him for dishonesty. Actually, in the Greek, the word that we translate throughout this passage, dishonest, in verses 9, 10, and 11, it comes up again and again, literally means unrighteous. But actually, is sometimes here, even in the text, translated worldly. So it says worldly wealth. It actually says unrighteous wealth. You could say dishonest wealth. So really the point that Jesus is making here is this man was a worldly, secular man. Not spiritual. So he's not making a moral judgment in that sense. He's simply saying he's just an ordinary human being working in a worldly way. So what is going on here then? Well, I want to suggest to you that the steward here is actually foregoing his fees. There's a bit of debate that goes on with the commentators. Most of them agree that he is not simply reducing what the debtors owe to his master, and so therefore kind of you know, being dishonest with his master's money. No, what he's doing, he's waiving the interest on the debt. Some commentators say that. Other commentators say that he's waiving his fees as a manager. Some say he's doing both things at the same time. So it was common, you see, for uh, wealthy uh, businessmen to get around the ban on interest. So in Judea, you weren't allowed to pay interest or charge interest on loans. It was called usury. It's in the Old Testament. So what they did instead, instead of using money, they used uh, goods. So they charged interest in kind, often in oil and wheat, just like we see here. And that could be very high levels of interest, sometimes 80%, sometimes even 100%. But what was always the case was that the manager would charge fees for organizing the business deal. And that's what seems to be happening here. He's letting go of interest, or he's certainly letting go of his fees. He's letting go of his own personal short-term gain for a longer-term gain. He's letting go of his fees so that he can develop these relationships, this patronage that he needs. And it's because of that that his master commends him. He hasn't lost out his master, you see, and he recognizes that at long last, even though he wasn't doing it before, now finally the steward is acting shrewdly. He's acting with, he's, with, he's being streetwise. He's being prudent. At long last, he can say, yes, this is sharp. This is savvy. It's resourceful. It's astute. That's what's going on in the parable. And Jesus draws out a number of implications for us. Three things we're going to look at. He's, steward what you have, he says. Invest in people and worship God, not money. So let's start with that first one. 
steward what you have been given. The point of this parable essentially is this. What we have is not our own. What we have is not our own. God is the master. We are the stewards. And that's a a picture that is painted throughout the whole of the Bible. So right the way back in Chronicles, chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles, David prays, everything that we have comes from you. And of your own have we given you. So the biblical view of money is that it's not a possession, it's something we have been given in trust. Now, if you're anything like me, you react a little bit against that. You think, hang on, it's my money. I've worked hard for it. I've made sacrifices for it. But if you think for a moment, what made it possible for you to make the money that you have made? You're alive. You're healthy. That helps, doesn't it? You have the particular talents and skills that are valued by your employer. You live in London, where there are jobs, less than there used to be, but there are still there's still work available. All of those things we take for granted, but all of them are gifts from God. All that we have comes from God. It's not, it's not a possession, it's something we've been given on trust. And you know, that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? It makes a, a huge difference to our attitude towards what we have. Who looks after a car better when they've borrowed it from someone? You do, don't you? If you've borrowed your friend's car, you're really careful with it. You don't worry about getting a little nick or a dent if it's your own. But when you're borrowing someone else's car, then you worry. Then you're careful. So it makes a huge difference to our attitude. It also makes a huge difference to our sense of responsibility. And this is a hard thing to hear, but I think hear it we must, all of us. It's God who can say to us what we should be doing with our money. And when we say to him, no God, I'm going to do with it what I want to do with it, That's theft. When we are, when we refuse to be generous to others, that's not miserliness. It's robbery. That's what the prophets say in the Old Testament. And you might say, hang on a second, 10%, which is the amount the prophets said that we should give to God. That's an awful lot of money to be giving. Well, imagine an investor comes to you and says, I want, to, I want you to invest my money. I want you to use it and, and make money from it. And, I want, and I'm happy for you to keep 90% of my investment. All I want back is 10%. Who wouldn't jump at that investment? That's inc- no, nobody is that generous, are they? But that is the situation with God. And all he says to us is use the 10% as I have instructed you. And that's why as part of this series, uh, Jackie, our treasurer, has been encouraging us to move from our standing order scheme to our stewardship scheme, which is essentially a direct debit scheme. It allows us all to manage that 10% that God has asked us to give more effectively. It's an opportunity right at the beginning of 2013 for us to get it right. So what this parable is saying is that we are all stewards. The question is, are you a good steward or a bad steward? To be a good steward, Jesus says, you need to be shrewd. Now, I'm reiterating, that's not a call to be dishonest, but to be smart, to be resourceful, practical, wise, That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew's gospel. In chapter 10, verse 16, when he says, Be as shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means you need to use your money well. It's so easy for us as Christians to be hyper-spiritual about it. But money, it is a spiritual issue, but it's a practical issue. 
So we need to know how money works if we are going to be shrewd stewards. We need to have financial intelligence. We need to know that we should live within our means. We need to know how to budget. We need to know that we probably ought to bin the credit card. We should prioritize paying off debt. We should start to save if we can. Now, my dad is one of the most shrewd people that I know. He's one of those guys that would uh, put all his expenditure every month on the credit card and then pay it off in full every month, and after six months would move to another credit card so that he was never paying any interest on anything. And so he managed his money perfectly. As a result, I could never be bothered to do that. I kind of reacted against that. He just, it felt a bit miserly to me. And so I've had to learn, and it's not always easy. I find budgeting a challenge. When Joanna and I got married, we had some debts from university. It took us a number of years to pay those off. But when we made that decision to prioritize paying off our debts, the freedom that we experienced after that was extraordinary. And since then, we've been able to save. And we're not perfect, but we don't do badly at balancing the books. So live within your means. Know how to negotiate a deal. Know what, that you need to read the fine print. Shop around for bargains. Having financial intelligence means knowing how to make money, how to save money, how to invest money, how to track money. As I was uh, reading around this week on this subject, I came across a great article, I think it was in the Times, about uh, a campaign journalist, a biographer called Richard Ben Kramer. Sadly, he died recently, only at the age of 62. But he had followed a number of uh, US presidential campaigns. And uh, he records an experience he had of Joe Biden, who is now the vice president. But back in 1988, he was running for the presidency. And uh, this is what he said about him. He said, when Joe Biden gets going on a deal, He'll talk that deal until it's shimmering before your eyes, in God's holy light, like the Taj Mahal. And all you can say in response is, where do I sign? And he goes on, the, the writer goes on to say, little wonder that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell stood little chance in his recent negotiations with Biden over the financial cliff, the fiscal cliff, rather. He knew how to make a deal. Now, you might be sitting there th th this morning thinking, well, it might be easy for Joe Biden. But actually, I find that much more difficult. I don't have that financial intelligence. How do I get it? Well, let me tell you, St. Paul Shadwell is full of shrewd people. It really is. We're in it together. Let me tell you a story. We have a school, a free school meeting in our crypt. And uh, we had a discussion about whether it would be a good idea for them to meet in our crypt. It meant we got uh, some significant investment in our crypt. If you haven't seen it, go and have a look. But we weren't sure whether that was the right thing to do. So we asked some shrewd people to make sure that the deal we were negotiating was going to be good for us. Jackie. Jackie. Rupert, Henrik, John Shippen, Darren Wolf. Oh my goodness. And me. <laughs> I could have killed them all at some point in that process. Careful, cautious, precise, looking at every detail, asking every question, looking at every eventuality. It drove me insane. It took us ages. They were brilliant. And they are all here. Jackie is actually putting on a Live Smart morning. There are some flyers at the back on the 9th of February. She's going to be looking at budgeting, personal effectiveness, efficient use of resources. People pay for that kind of input. It's available to us as a community. So steward what you have been given. Secondly, Jesus is drawing from this parable 
that we need to invest in people. Look, he says in verse 9, manage your money in the light of eternity. You see how the steward forgoes his short-term gain for long-term gain. And Jesus says, so should we. Any investment, any good investment, is an investment for the future, isn't it? It accrues interest, it grows, it increases in value. So what is a good investment? Jesus reminds us that worldly wealth always runs out. Do you see in verse 9, he says, when it is gone. We all know, don't we, that we can't take it with us. Your iPad, your Kindle, your beautiful house, your new car, your clothes that you got for Christmas, all your savings in the bank, you can't take it with you when you go. So, says Jesus, invest in the kingdom. Put your money into eternal things, things that last. That is the real investment. Isn't that a bit abstract, though? Does it excite you to think about that? Maybe it just leaves your heart a little bit cold. Well, Jesus pushes it a bit further because he says to us, don't just invest in the kingdom, invest in relationships that will last forever. That's what the kingdom looks like. Notice he says, use worldly wealth to gain friends so you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Very odd verse. What's he saying? Well, he's describing eternity here, but not in abstract terms like streets of gold and great mansions. He's not painting a picture of sitting on a cloud, stroking a harp with Wings, eating Philadelphia. He's talking about friends. He's saying people matter more than anything. People matter more than things. And God gives to you and God gives through you to others. And that means simply we should never make money at the expense of people. And we should always put our money into people's needs. Last week, Jackie was talking to me about setting up a credit union in the church. What a fantastic idea, investing in people. Speak to her afterwards if you're passionate about that. Jonathan and Helen were talking to me about developing a babysitting network using a website. What a brilliant idea for us as a church. We've got so many babies and children that need babysitting. Rick has been working hard with others on the missional housing bond, working with the diocese, working with the Contextual Theology Centre. I don't know if you know, but in East London, housing for church leaders is the biggest challenge we face to planting churches because it costs a fortune. The missional housing bond is a way of investing in housing for leaders in the future. What a brilliant way of investing in the kingdom. It's being launched in February. Look out for it. So a commentator, as he looks at Luke's gospel, says this. Through, although these things, your property, ability, and time, belong to this life only, Jesus says, what will happen to you when you pass into the afterlife will depend on what you were doing with them in the here and now. Make sure that the use of your money brings you into a fellowship of friends that will survive beyond death. So he says, steward what you have been given, invest in people. Thirdly, worship God, not money. Look at verse 13. He says really clearly, you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus' attitude to money is it's a great tool, but it's a terrible idol. And yet it is the main rival to God in our affections. And you can only be shrewd, Jesus is saying here, with your money if you are not ruled by your money. So don't be unfaithful. Don't let your affections be drawn away from God to an idol. Split loyalties, he says, simply cannot work. And besides, money ultimately always lets you down. It's so demanding you will suffer, your relationships will suffer, your spiritual life will suffer. 
So he says, don't get enslaved to an all-consuming love of money. And he says that because wealth is the key indicator of the state of our hearts. Earlier on in the gospel, in chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what's the priority in your life? Where's your passion? And how can we ensure that God, not money, is our treasure? That God, not money, is our priority, our first love? What can capture and motivate our hearts? It's when we realize that it's not about how much we have, but who he is. You see, what I think Jesus wants us to realize most significantly of all from this parable is that Jesus himself is the true and better steward. You see, Jesus is the friend who loses all his wealth to turn his enemies into his friends. Jesus gives away all his wealth to turn his enemies into friends. He comes from the riches of heaven where he sat at the right hand of his Father in glory, and he embraces the poverty of our humanity. Why? To cancel our spiritual debt. To make us friends with God. That's what Paul means in his second letter to the Corinthians when he says, for you know the grace of God. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that grace? What does it look like? He says that though he, Jesus, was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. as we allow that truth and reality to sink down into our hearts that we can worship God not money so just to wrap things up how can we be shrewd but not dishonest steward what you have been given. Get some financial intelligence. I'd love to see a queue around Jackie or a crowd around Jackie after the service. I think she's there. There she is. Wave. Sign up for the Live Smart morning. Take the opportunity this month to get your stewardship Secondly, invest in people, that fellowship of friends that will last forever. Think about what you want to invest your money in. It might be the missional housing bond, or a credit union, or a babysitting circle. And worship God, not money. Get your priorities right by celebrating the gospel of the true steward who gave it all away that you can be his friend.